Amen. Good morning. It's uh, thankful to be able to gather together uh, via Facebook Live and worship the Lord. Uh, Lord willing, uh, we will be worshiping in person very soon. Uh, more on that, I guess, later as the week develops. A few announcements. Please continue to remember to make your donations to the Hands of Mercy Food Bank. Uh, they are much needed. I heard a story just this past week uh, about a, a fellow who worked in the restaurant industry as a server, and the restaurant that he works for is closed. So now he has no source of income, and there are stories like that all around all around us. So please continue to remember to help these people who, uh, who desperately need it. Remember, the recording of this service will be available on our YouTube channel by 7.30 this evening. Also, just once again by way of reminder, you can send your tithes and offerings here to the church via mail, or you can go to our website, www.youngschapel.org, and click on the Donate button there. And those are all of the announcements that we have for this morning. call to worship this morning comes from the 96th Psalm. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Let us pray. Lord, we do come before you this morning, and it is our desire to crown you, Lord, of all of our lives and all of our hearts. And Lord, as we do that, we want to adore you. We want to magnify and glorify your precious and holy name. Father, we adore you because you heal our broken hearts. We bring you praise because you bind up our wounds. Gracious Father, we come before you and adore you because you have redeemed us through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Now we're going to say together what we believe. We're going to affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Right now we want to take prayer requests, uh, some that are, were lifted up during this week. Uh, one in particular is a praise. Um, Sheila Crabtree's grandson, Trey Bennett, was being tested for, uh, for COVID-19. And uh, as of yesterday or the day before, I can't remember which, his test results came back negative. So that is a word of praise. One prayer request uh, is uh, on a personal level is for me. On the 29th of this month, uh, I'm going to be having ankle surgery. Uh, the brace that I wear, it has become such that um, it's not feeling too good at the end of the day, and the doctors have said the only solution is to do the ankle surgery, and the surgery won't be bad, as bad as the uh, recovery process that is to follow. So please be in prayer for me, and especially be in prayer for Lori that I would be a good patient. Can I get an amen from some of you? Amen? <laughs> uh, right here. But anyway. Uh, just request your prayers for that. At this time, let's go before God and lift up our prayers. And, and just remember that you can send in your prayer request uh, via email here to ycpastor at comcast.net, or you can phone them in to 865-376-2192 and, and leave your message there. Let us pray. Lord, we pause and we come before you once again this morning to give you praise and to lift up your mighty name. Lord, we just bow down before you. And as we do, we humbly confess our sins. Lord, we, we come here uh, this morning at the end of another week and we're burdened by our sins. We're, we're bruised and beaten down because of our sins. Our sins grieve us. Lord, we have been guilty of pride and selfishness, of, of lust and envy and, and gossip and a myriad of other sins, Father, in our lives. And Lord, we, we just come to you and seek the forgiveness that only you can give. We ask that you would be gracious to us according to your great compassion, that you would blot out our sins, that you would wash away our iniquity, Father. Cleanse us, Lord. Cleanse us and make us whiter than snow. Create within us a clean heart. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. And Father, we thank you that that's exactly what you will do, that that is what your word has promised to us. Lord, you have, through, through the life, death, and resurrection of your beloved Son, you have bore our sins and you have forgiven us. And Father, we thank you for the righteousness that has, comes to us only through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we come to you now and we lift up the prayer requests that are on our list this morning. And as we do so, it is in the sure promise that you hear and answer these prayers. And Lord, we also come and we bring to, before you the, the leaders of our community, the leaders of our state, the leaders of this great nation that you have blessed us with. Fill them with wisdom. Fill them with your grace. Father, help them to make the decisions according to your word. And Father, we pray for our churches here in Kingston and, and the churches here in the state of Tennessee and in our nation and indeed around the world. May we each be faithful to proclaim your gospel, to tell the truth of your word, that we would boldly tell others of the grace and forgiveness that is found in your son, Jesus Christ, and in him alone. Lord, we just pray for the salvation of the people that we know, Father, our friends, our family, our co-workers. Father, bring them to a saving knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, now we pray for one another. As you, uh, and Lord, we just ask that we would grow in the grace and the knowledge of your Son. 
May his love abound in our hearts. Father, help us to be pure and blameless until the day of your son's return. Fill us with a fruit of righteousness that comes only through a knowledge of him. Father, and we just ask for these things in the name of Jesus Christ. And we, we close this prayer with a prayer that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right now, uh, Linda and Kate are going to come and share with us in song. who say that uh, we should stop preaching the gospel, that we are uh, silly to do so. But the scriptures are clear. It is through the foolishness of preaching the gospel that people come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So pray for me that I would preach the gospel here this morning and pray that we would hear the gospel and that our hearts would be changed and our lives will be changed. Sometimes we think, well, I was saved a long time ago. I don't need to hear the gospel anymore. Well, you know, it's like that old hymn, I love to tell the story for those who know it best. I love to hear about how my Savior has redeemed me because each time I hear it, I think I learn something more, and I'm reminded of the grace that set my own heart free. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Samuel 
in the 24th chapter. Some of you may have been waiting for a long time to get the 24th chapter of 2 Samuel because it is indeed the final chapter of, uh, of Samuel, of First and Second Samuel. With that said, I'll begin reading in the first verse. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army, who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's word prevailed against Joab and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went throughout, or went from the presence of the king to number the pieces, the people of Israel. And then verses 5 through um, 9, they talk about the route that they took. And then in verse 9, it says that when they numbered the census there, that in Israel there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. Then beginning in verse 10, But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer you. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days of pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aranah, the Jebusite. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you that we are indeed able to uh, read your word and to hear it proclaimed. Lord, may we never take this for granted. And Father, as we turn to your word, soften our hearts, unstop our ears, and open our blind eyes. Speak to us through the power of your spirit. In your name we pray. Amen. When I was uh, about 12 or 13 years old, my father agreed to, uh, to help tear down my na our neighbor's garage in exchange for keeping the lumber, what lumber he could salvage from that garage. So me and my two brothers were assigned the task of destruction, which we delighted in. You know, we're 13 years old and we, we like tearing things up. So. We, we, we did that, and, and we took the lumber down, and we stacked it over on our property. And the lumber, part of it was used to build an outbuilding and a pole garage, but there was a great deal of it left, and that, that was to be put in a wood pile. We were to neatly stack it to one side of the garage that we had built. And what happened next has always been a mystery to me, because when the wood pile was there, you know, which was as tall as me as I am now or taller and, you know, 8, 12, 15 feet around. But anyway, it was a big old wood pile. Dad would just say, move the wood pile. You know, was, we was on the side of the garage. Well, where did he move to? Move it behind the garage. And you just move the wood pile. Then a few weeks later, move the wood pile. Where do you want to move it? Move it to the other side of the garage. And we go, well, you know, why? 
move the wood pile. <laughs> that was all we were told. And it didn't make any sense. I th- you know, why this mystery surrounding the moving of the wood pile? When we, I went to my mom and I asked the question that I knew was burning in the hearts and the minds of my two brothers. Why does dad want us to move the wood pile? And she gave us the brilliant answer, I don't know. <laughs> she could not explain. So none of us knew. And that was very frustrating. And looking back, the reality is, is we didn't need to know why he wanted the woodpile moved. If Dad said to move the woodpile, that was it. That was law. This is sort of akin to what's going on in 2 Samuel 24 in regards to the census. The census seems to be senseless. At least it is in Joab's view. That's what we get in verse 3. And not only that, a census would be sinful according to what David says in verse 10. And it's not only sinful, it's punishable as God tells us in verse 15. So the census is sinful and it is senseless. But why is it wrong? Why is counting culpable? And that'll be enough alliteration for the moment. Hopefully we won't do any more of that, but I won't make any promises. But attempts to answer the question, those questions fill page after page of the commentaries that are sitting on the desk in my office right now. And as I, uh, and as near as I can count, there are only, or at least four explanations that they offer for this sense is senseless. But none of, a, none of the four explanations can say with certainty why the census was wrong. Now, why can't they give us that? Because there is no explicit reason given here in 2 Samuel chapter 24. We just don't know why it's wrong. I can only assume that the matter does not matter. It was wrong, but we don't need to know why it's wrong. In other words, move the wood pile. We, we just don't know. So there's a mystery here. A mystery we cannot explain. Verse 1 tells us that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. But we don't know why. We don't know, we can't find any reason why in these verses. And the mystery deepens if you look, as we look into the second half of the first verse. We read there that not only was the Lord angry with Israel, he also, the Lord also incited David against them, saying, go and number Israel in Judah. So God is angry with Israel. He's going to judge Israel. And in turn, he makes David angry with Israel. And he tells David to conduct this senseless census, which is sinful. And, you know, I got to reading about a census. And I, I wonder if the people of Israel got as many annoying commercials and messages about filling out the census as you. If, can I get a witness on that? I mean, every time you turn around, fill out the census. Fill out, oh, I did that eight months ago. You know, and, but anyway, that's uh, that's an aside. But, you know, so verse 1, there's this mystery. We run smack dab into it, and it sets our heads spinning and our minds going in all kinds of directions. You know, how can God stir up David to do something and then turn around and hold David guilty for what he does? And if we're not careful here, we can turn and tie ourselves into all sorts of theological knots trying to answer that question. And it's a question that's not really answerable here in a Sunday morning sermon. It's more fitting in a, in a Bible study group, so we're not going to dive into it here this morning. The bottom line for me is found in verse 10 where David says, I have sinned greatly against the Lord in what I have done. David takes responsibility. He takes responsibility for his actions. He does not blame God. He never says, you know, Lord, if you had disturbed me up, I never would have done that. He just says, I have sinned. So he takes full responsibility, but we still don't know why God is angry with Israel. God's wrath burns against Israel, and he's going to use David as the means or the vehicle of his wrath but we still don't know why the text states the reality of his wrath, of God's wrath, but not the reason for it. And that can be, and it is, a sticking point for a lot of people. We want an explanation, 
for how, why things happen the way they happen, don't we? We want to know the reason. And over the years, I've heard people say, well, God did this in my life or that in my life to bring about this results or result or because of this or because of that. That's why this happened. And we as human beings, we as people have a desire to make sense of things, don't we? We want an explanation. We want life to make sense, and we want God's actions to make sense. We want to know all of the whys of any given set of circumstances in our life. We don't like a mystery unless it's in a mystery novel and we get to hear the conclusion of it, you know, somewhere around the last page. But the reality is that there are some things that happen in this life that we're just never, ever going to fully understand. You know, why, why is it that a couple who desperately wants children, they can't conceive, but there are women who are addicted to meth and give birth to babies that are addicted to meth. They pop out babies all the time. Why is a 16-year-old killed in a head-on collision on his way to church because a drunk driver goes over a blind hill on the wrong side of the road? Why is a 12-year-old girl shot to death on Monday morning you know, she acolyted on Sunday morning, and she shot to death on Monday morning, her and her mother. And why does a three-month-old baby die of leukemia? And I don't pull these examples out of thin air. These happen to real-life people in, in their real-life situations that have, have occurred during the course of my pastoral, of the time I've been in the pastoral ministry. And I bring them up not to bring you down or make you feel bad, but to point out, you know, sometimes you just don't know why. You just don't know why. There's a mystery. And it's during those times that our faith boils down to trusting in our sovereign, loving, gracious, merciful God. Just like my, with my dad. I don't need to know why I have to move the wood pile. I sim simply need to trust that he knows best, even if I don't know why. And if we don't trust our sovereign Lord, if we can't accept the mystery of God as presented to us in the text, is presented to us in the in this text of Scripture, I think we're tipping our hand a little bit. We're saying that we know better, right? Is that what we're doing? If we can't trust God, we're saying that we know better than God. We're saying, God, you owe me an explanation. And that's arrogance on our part, I believe, to think that we know better than our creator, God. Beloved, can we truly worship a God that we can explain? Isn't a God that we can pin down and explain a God of our own making? Isn't that what that is? And isn't a God of our own making, isn't that an idol? If we make God in our own image and we want God to be what we want him to be, that's an idol? That's what that is? And are we angry that God isn't perfectly transparent? Can we live with the mystery of God, knowing that he is infinite and we are, and we are finite? That there are some things that we just can't understand? Next we see in this passage, not only is there mystery here, but there's mercy. There is mercy here as well. Verse 10, David's heart struck him. The NIV says that his conscience was stricken. I like the KJV because it says there, David's heart smote him. I like the word smote, don't you? It's just a good word. David's heart smote him after he numbered the people. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, a, lang uh, a scholar of the Hebrew language by any stretch of the imagination, but as near as I can tell in reading the commentaries and other sources uh, about this verse, it's written in such a way as to mean that there was a process that led to David's heart being struck. In other words, while the census is going on, uh, somewhere in the back of David's mind, there's this nagging feeling that he shouldn't be doing it. It's just, it's, it's there, and the feeling keeps growing. And when it's all over, he wished he'd never done it. I think you know what I mean. Have you ever caught yourself in the middle of doing something that you decided to do, and as you're doing it, you know it's wrong? 
in the middle of doing it. And you know your actions are sinful, but you, you can't seem to stop. And then when things are over, when the deed is done, you just feel, feel sick inside. The full weight of your actions come crashing down on you. And like David, your heart struck. Your conscience stricken. And I know from personal experience that it does not feel good at all. But the truth is, beloved, that this is a blessed thing in the life of a believer because that is the conviction of sin. If you did it and had no conscience about doing it, that would mean you're not a believer. But because you're convicted of your sin, you are a believer. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. He convicts us of sin. And what a blessed thing it is when we are convicted of our sin. You know, we can, I have fallen short of your word and your glory. Lord, you have stricken my conscience. You have stricken my heart. Bless God when that happens. Bless God when he pulls you up short and he knocks you down to where you ought to be and he reminds you that you've gotten too big for your britches or like a lady that I think of right now from when we were young and lived in Carthage, Texas. Her name was Winnell Steptoe. She'd look at me and say, Dale, watching you done split your britches. You know, and so bless God when he does that to us. And when that happens, we need to do what David does in the second half of the verse. He goes before the Lord in prayer, and he says, I have sinned greatly in what I've done. Lord, I've sinned. Lord, I've messed up. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant. God, forgive me of my sin. I've done foolishly. And you know what? He will. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then a month later we say, well, Lord, I did this and we feel bad all over again. Are we going to take God at his word that we're already forgiven for that? Let's take God at his word. Let's walk in that forgiveness. Let's fall on our knees and ask God to take away our sins and then rest in the sure promise of his word that that is exactly what he does. Then in verse 11, uh, the prophet Gad arrives on the scene. He comes to David, and he gives David a multiple-choice question that comes to him from the Lord, and it's a multiple-choice question regarding the wrath of God. Three choices, three years of famine, three months of fleeing before your enemies, or three days of pestilence. Which one do you want, David? You know, and it's multiple choice, and I go like, isn't there a D here? You know, none of the above? Can't... There, there, but there's no none of the above option here. And David's response in verse 14 is really quite, quite astounding. David says, I am in great distress. I can imagine that. You know, the wrath is coming. Here's You choose how it comes. And David says, let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. Look at what's happening. David is staring straight down the barrel of God's wrath, of God's judgment, and yet at the same time he's convinced of God's mercy. Somehow David believes that the hand that is about to strike him is nonetheless the hand that will spare him as well. And this is the third time we've seen David do something like this. The first time is in 2 Samuel 12 in regard to his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. He falls down before Nathan the prophet when Nathan convicts him of his sin and brings it up. And David says, I have sinned against the Lord. And part of the consequences of David's sin was is that the child that was conceived would die. And sure enough, it wasn't long before the child was stricken with illness. And what does David do? Does he just say, oh, well, this is what uh, the Lord's going to do? No, he falls on his face in prayer, and he fasts, and he begs God to save the the life of the child. And the servants are worried about him. They try to pick him up off the floor. He won't get up off the floor. He won't eat. He won't bathe. He won't do anything. And then the child does indeed die. And David's servants are fearful to tell him because look at how he's acting in the ch- while the child is still alive. He might kill himself if he finds out the child is dead. But David 
finally catches wind and he catches up with what's going on. And what does he do? He gets up, takes a shower, puts on clean clothes, goes to worship, comes home and asks for a home-cooked meal. That's what he does. His servants are confused to say the least. I mean, David, why have you behaved this way? When the child was alive, you wept, you fasted, and you prayed. Now he's dead, and you go to church, and you want fried chicken and tater salad for supper? What's what's going on here? They asked David, and David answers, Who knows? God may show grace to me, and the child might have lived. David knew that that, that showing grace was God's forte. That was God's character. That's who he was. The second time we see David doing this and throwing himself on the mercy of God is in the 16th chapter of 2 Samuel. That's where Shimei, a.k.a. Ernest T. Bass, is throwing rocks and insults at David. And David's men want to slice off uh, Shimei's head. David says, leave him alone. Let him curse. It may be that the Lord will look on the wrong done to me, and the Lord will repay me with good for cursing. There it is again. David believes in a God of unfathomable and unguessable grace, a God who who will replace cursing with blessing, a God who has a wonderful way of looking on our guilt and showing us mercy. And now here in 2 Samuel 24, we see it a third time. David throws himself on the mercy of the Lord. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. What an amazing testimony. A testimony to how David knows his God. You see, in the face of his crisis, in the face of every crisis in his life, indeed, He knows what he believes about God, and he places his trust and faith in the God that he knows. In other words, David's theology sees him through. His belief and his trust in the truth of God and God's word gives him the strength and the courage that he needs in the hour of trial. You know, beloved, that's why you and I need to know what we believe before the trial comes. We need to know what we believe before the hard times hit. I mean, how can your faith be the anchor of your soul if you don't even know what that faith is made up of? How can we hang on to the truth of Scripture if we don't know the Scripture? How can we know the God of Scripture apart from reading the Scripture and studying the Scripture? And what good is it to know the truth of Scripture unless it sets our heart on fire with a love for the God of Scripture. In other words, now is the time to come to grips with what you believe. It's too late when the storms hit. It's too late to build a bomb shelter when the planes are overhead and the bombs are dropping. It's all over then. David's theology, what he believed about the God, about God, and you do have a theology. You do know what you believe about God. That's all that is. It's more than in his head. He knew more than just Bible verses. He knew God in a personal way. He loved his God, and he knew that his God loved him. And the truth about God and who, true, who God truly is led David to fall in love with the God of the Bible. So when David said, let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, it was just reflex action. It was, it was like breathing to him. He didn't even have to think about it. It was a part of who he was. He knew that there was no softer pillow to fall upon than the hands of his loving, caring, gracious God in this time of crisis. Isn't that how every one of us should be? how every believer, don't we need our best theology for our darkest moments? And in the disasters and sins and the hard times of life, is there any kinder or softer place to fall than the hand of God? You know, I read a story once about an incident that happened at the Brookfield, Illinois Zoo. A three-year-old fell 18 feet into the gorilla pit. And the little boy... uh, was uh, alert as as he was taken to the hospital 
and he was listed in critical condition, but he was alive. Well, how did he escape from the gorilla pit? How did he get out of there? It seems that Bentai, a seven-year-old female gorilla, picked him up, cradled him in her arms, and then sat him down near a door where the zookeepers could get him. And I suppose the story seems amazing to us because we don't normally associate kindness with gorillas, do we? We may be grateful to Bentai for what she did, but I don't think you would ask her to babysit your children or your grandchildren, would you? I wonder sometimes if our gut level thinking, in our gut level thinking, if we don't have a gorilla view of God and his mercy. We tend to look upon mercy as a divine exception instead of divine character. That's not how David looks at it, is it? Even in his wrath, David knew he wasn't facing a gorilla god. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. Here's David. Here's a man who has a grip on the meaning of mercy. And I think it's more than that. It's more than just having a grip on the meaning of mercy. Divine mercy has a grip on him. Divine mercy has a grip on his mind, on his heart, and on his life. That's why it's a reflex action. Now we come to the closing verses of 2 Samuel 24, and indeed the closing verses of 2 Samuel. And to understand these final verses, we've got to jump back up to verse 16. There we find that the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, remember 70,000 people were destroyed by this plague and the angel is there and the Lord uh, asked him to relent and the Lord does that by saying, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aaronah the Jebusite. In other words, David was right, wasn't he? He was right about the mercy of God. The Lord held back the destroying hand of the angel. At, and he did so at the threshing floor of Aaronah. And the Lord or, orders David to build an altar there. Now, why would the Lord ask David to build an altar? Because he wants David to build, make sacrifices, right? So if God commands him to build the altar, then the sacrifices are implied. In other words, when the Lord stayed the hand of the destroying angel in verse 16, things weren't resolved. It wasn't over, was it? The hand was held back, and when the hand is held back, God tells David, now go there, I've stopped the angel, go build an altar. That's what's going on. The plague ceases in verse 16, but the wrath associated with the plague can't be cut short or put on hold. That wrath has to be dealt with. Our God is a just God. And we see how it's dealt with very clearly in verse 21. And Aaron said to David, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. So there's that clear connection between the sacrifices that David is about to make and the restraining of God's wrath in the form of this plague. So and in those verses, Aaron says, I'll give you the ox, I'll give you the land, I'll give it all to you, uh, you know, whatever you need to make this sacrifice, king, I'll give it to you. And David says, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord that cost me nothing. Now there's a verse to take home with you. Well, you're already at home. Uh, there's a verse to take to heart. You know, it's easy to be a Christian in Kingston, Tennessee, isn't it? But does it really cost you anything? Does it cost you anything to be a Christian here? Beloved, God wants you. Beloved, God wants all of you. He wants your heart. He wants your mind. He wants your soul. He wants everything about you. He wants your life. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. David weighs out 50 shekels of silver, offers up burnt offerings and peace offerings to the Lord, and then something happens. After he offers the peace offering, 
After the blood of the sacrificial animal was shed, the plague on Israel was stopped. And the plague on Israel was stopped because the wrath of God had been satisfied through the shedding of blood. As Hebrews 9.22 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Charles Wesley sings, "'Tis mercy all, immense and free." And it's a mystery. Why would God forgive me? What possible reason? But the mystery of his wrath and the mystery of his mercy. I mean, God in mercy restrains his wrath, and God in mercy provides the way for removing his wrath, and it's through this atoning sacrifice What we have here is a God-directed and God-provided atonement. It was God who ordered the angel to stop. It was God who provided the means to satisfy his wrath by way of the sacrifice that was offered on the threshing floor. It was God from the get-go. And that's the gospel right here in 2 Samuel 24. And, beloved, we need to remember that the whole Bible... The Old Testament and New Testament, it's just a book about Jesus, and it's a book about the gospel. And this is proof of it right here because this is a wonderful picture of the gospel. God said that you and I must keep his word. We have to keep his law. We have to do it perfectly or we face his wrath and his judgment. And then what does he do? He stays his hand. Right now, God's hand is stayed. He knows that we can't perfectly keep his law. He knows we can't keep his commandments. But he still holds back his hand, providing us with an opportunity to turn to him. But his wrath still has to be satisfied, doesn't it? Justice has to be fulfilled. So what does God do? He provides the means. God, in his mercy, sent his one and only son into the world to take upon himself the wrath that you deserve and the wrath that I deserve. And Wesley says it again in the same song. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? That's it. That's the gospel. Do you know that gospel? Do you know that Savior? Do you know that mercy? You're staring down the barrel of God's wrath this morning. And that same God has provided the means for your redemption. Praise God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these books of First and Second Samuel that have taught us so much about your gospel. Thank you for the pictures of the gospel that we have found here. Thank you for its fulfillment in the coming of your son, Jesus Christ. Bless us now, Lord. May we live and serve you. In Christ's name we ask. Amen.